The topic tonight is going to be talking about taking smart risks. So we're going to get all over what I've learned about taking risks so that you can learn from me and take risks smartly and advance your career uh, well and better that way. So look, I started thinking about risk for this show, and I realized I've taken a lot of blind risks. And by blind risks, I mean I failed the first part of what I'm gonna talk about. And what I failed, um, <laughs> what I failed, see, chat caught me, but I didn't engage. Um, what I failed is I didn't recognize some risks I was taking until I was in the middle of the shit and dealing with the consequences of the risk going bad. So let me rattle off the three steps we're going to talk about tonight. It's like a great clip somebody can share out. Number one, you got to recognize that you're actually about to take a risk because sometimes it's not obvious that you're making a decision. You're just going along and not realizing that you're committing more and more to something. Number two, the Amazon secret is that you then identify and control the inputs to the risk. You can't directly control the outcome. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a risk. You just make what you wanted happen. But you can control the inputs, and that's how you prep for a risk. And number three, you consider the consequences, and you get ready for them. And so you prepare for the consequences, and that's the three steps, recognize you're taking a risk, control the inputs, prepare for the consequences if it goes wrong. Um, all right. So the thing to talk about here, risk itself isn't that interesting. You only take a risk when there's a reward. You're looking for a risk reward. Look, here's a story of when I screwed up and backed into a risk. So a couple of years ago, uh, a few years ago now, I was climbing Mount Adams. Mount Adams is the second highest volcano in um, second, second highest mountain, second highest volcano in Washington. And it's 12,000, I think 200, but 12,100, 12,200 feet. And you climb from 6,000. So it's good to see there's a lot of eggplants here. Um, so I was an eggplant in this case, and I put my skis on with a buddy of mine and we started skinning up. So skiing upwards, uh, skiing up, uh, the, uh, Mount Rainier. And as we got, uh, or sorry, Mount, uh, Adams. And as we got near the top, uh, it was great. We had a great time and we skied back down a little and we met these two other people and there was a little rock rib that divided two ways down the mountain. And we had come up on the left and these two people said, oh, you gotta shoot, ski these chutes to the right. They're gonna be so much better. Like you should come with us, go to the right. And we screwed it up. And in this sense, I didn't think about it. I'm like, sure, sounds great. Hey, my friend was Paul. Paul, do you wanna go this way? Let's go. I didn't realize I was about to take a bunch of risks and I'm gonna, Obviously, I survived them, um, but uh, I backed into three risks, and I want to point this out because it's very easy. We're just like, hey, we're skiing. We've climbed the mountain. We're done. It's like ski down time, then have a beer. We start skiing down. Problem number one, it's very steep. Now, I don't mind steep, but the snow starts sliding with us, which is a sign of avalanche risk, and so there are surface snow slides chasing us down and we actually have to ski behind rocks and let waves of snow go by and then ski some more and more snow comes down so stupid risk number one was we got into avalanche terrain that we didn't know about because we skied somewhere different than we had walked up so we're skiing on a mountain we don't know with people we don't know in terrain we don't know and we were suckered into it so easily which is they said hey come this way oh okay i'll come this way Total idiot. Um, turns out, though, we eventually survived that part. So thing number two, along the way, I'm trying to see where we're going. And I have on really dark shades because you climb in the summer, but there's snow on the glaciers. And so you have really dark 
sunglasses called glacier glasses, and I'm having trouble seeing where the hell I'm going. So I push him up on my forehead and keep skiing on the snow and the sun because it's July. My friend Paul and I usually climb on 4th of July weekend. So we'll come back to this point later. Just remember, I put my sunglasses on my forehead and kept skiing. Well, thing number three, we'll see how many uh, mathematicians or geometry lovers, lovers there are here. I said at the top, there was this little rock ridge that separated the two ways. But if you think of a mountain as basically a circle and the peak is at the point, at the peak, every place you go, every direction you go is equal distant. But as you take those two paths down, the way we came up on one side and the way we went down on the other, they get further and further apart. And when we got down to the 6,000 foot level where we needed to go back to our parking lot and the car, even though we started out like 50 feet or 100 feet from the other way down, out on the perimeter of the circle, we were three miles away from our car. And so that means putting your skis on your back and you're wearing ski boots and putting all your other crap on your back and hiking along a half melted out, half overgrown trail sideways around the mountain. Now remember, we've climbed all day. We got up before dawn and we've climbed 6,000 feet. Then we've skied down and now suddenly we have to put all our crap on our back and hike out. And I think, by the way, we have to change the question um, thing because it says, that uh, this is one of the changes in the branding. Anyone can type uh, bang question and get the answers, but in fact, only mods can do it. So we hike around the mountain, we get back to our cars, we're freaking exhausted, we have our beer. I start driving home. And um, all right, so a lot of people wanna know how to ask questions. And it works if you're a mod. <clears throat> so we'll change the instructions. Or we'll change the way the chatbot works. Anyway, um, I start driving home. Now, remember the sunglasses? Third place, I didn't know I was taking a risk. I was on snow in the summer. The climbing route on Mount Adams is to the south. You're looking right into the sun. I ended up, uh, I'm driving home and my eyes start burning. I can't stop blinking. When I mean I can't stop blinking, I'm actually trying to drive up I-5 in Seattle or towards Seattle, and I am blinking uncontrollably. Turns out I have oncoming snow blindness, like the Eskimos. I have burned the back of my retinas from being on the snow in the sun. Yeah, Liger box. Okay, sure, the physician knows, absolutely. And I'm gonna read chat now. Duke of Thought, you are right. When I tell stories tonight, you're gonna be like, that idiot should be dead. And you're actually right, I probably should be dead because most of my stories about risk have to do with risks that went wrong and shit that went wrong in the mountains. So for the next day, I was in agony because I had never before sunburned the inside of my eyeballs. I did not end up going all the way blind, but I will totally say never do this. Uh, it hurts like hell, you can't stop blinking. Closing your eyes doesn't help. Um, and no one else has complained about the audio, so I don't know what's up there, but we'll assume it's fine. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So back to risk. This is the point of this is, look, I took a bunch of risks without knowing it. Here I was thinking I was skiing back down to the car and I ended up in avalanche train with sunburn eyeballs on a three mile walk. One of the keys to taking smart risks is knowing that you're about to take a risk. And in that case, laziness and thinking like, oh, I'm skiing, um, thinking uh, I'm skiing rather than I'm about to take a bunch of high risk activities on caused me to end up in risk without knowing it. So a couple things, a um, uh, couple things going on then is look, 
it's most important if you want to get risks right and take smart risks to at least know and realize when are you about to take a risk. And so step one is step back often and say, am I making a decision here? Um, am I about to take a risk? Because you can't make a good decision if you don't know you're about to make a decision. And I'll pause for a minute and say we have got a lot of new viewers in. Thank you all for coming. I'm Ethan Evans. Tonight we're talking about taking smart risks. And if you haven't followed the channel, please follow so you can find us. Um, because we do this about once a week. And next week's show, we're going to have um, Amazon's head of student recruiting on talking about the way we hire thousands of interns and thousands of students uh, across the U.S. every year. So we'll have a live guest next week. Um, so, all right, I've talked about taking risk. I see you people have done the right thing. You've put in some questions for me and I can't wait to hit those up, but I have some more stories. And so we got to talk about them real quick. Um, I said the second step was control the inputs, control the controllable. So I'm going to tell another idiot story that will make you think I should be dead or somebody should be dead from when I was a kid. So as a kid, I grew up in Ohio. And in Ohio, when boys, particularly in the 70s, have nothing to do, what they do is play with guns. And so I just horrified all of my listeners in Europe who are like, what, they let 10-year-old boys play with guns in America? Yes, they do. So I was at a friend's house, and we had been out uh, looking for something to shoot all day, 10 cans, whatever. And I had a shotgun in my hands. And uh, some birds flew by and I cocked the shotgun because I was going to blow these birds out of the air because I was a mean little boy. I'm better now. I'm a nice older boy now. Um, but somehow the birds got away and I didn't blow them up. So all of you who are about to say I'm a horrible animal killer, I wasn't in that case. Um, but I had a cocked shotgun in my hands. And so... Um, I. My friend is standing across from me and I'm looking right at him with the shotgun. But important point, controllable input, something you can do to avoid a risk. I had been taught whenever you have a gun and you're not about to shoot something, point it at the ground. <laughs> not responding to chat, Devin. Not responding to chat. All right. Between while I'm answering questions. So. I um, point the shotgun towards the ground and I start to let the trigger down, but my finger is icy and I, I let the hammer, it slips through my fingers and I don't have the shotgun braced on my shoulder because I'm trying to let the hammer down and it goes off. And because all the kick is there, the recoil, it actually gets thrown right out of my hands behind me and soars through the air. But my then best friend is sitting, standing across from me and I blow a frickin crater in the field in front of his feet. Now, this is a funny story to me anyway, and to him 40 years later, because I had controlled a risk by planning up front and being conditioned to point the damn gun down. And so as a result, all I did was blow a huge hole in the dirt. But if I had not been pointing it down, I'd have killed him. Uh, and because I was looking right at him and I was too dumb to also point the gun away, which is another important point. Um, you want to take as many precautions as you can. So not only point the gun down, don't point it towards someone. But the reason to take as many controls as you can to avoid risk is it's okay to have what they call belt and suspenders. Hold your pants up with both a belt and suspenders so that you don't end up naked. All right, so what else chat got to say while I drink? Let's see. Abused grandpa bringing wolves and wild boars in. That's crazy. I don't want anything to do with wild boars. Wolves are cute far away and scary up close. Um, <laughs> Mullet Boy 3000, thank you for the Twitch Prime sub. 
Is this a 1902 saying, belt and suspenders? No, probably 1952, but not 02. All right, last thing before we hit questions. So if you want to get your questions in, there's 90 of you here. Go to our extension. We explained this earlier, but I'm going to say it again. The way we make great content for you and everyone is you go to our Twitch extension or you go to the link right here. And by the way, we fix this link. It damn well works now. You go to this link and you vote on what I'm going to talk about next because I'm almost done storytelling and we're going to roll the questions. So the last thing is consequences. You can plan ahead for consequences. Um, and the point here is when you're going to take a risk or a gamble, and I talked about this a little bit in my blog post about this, um, what differentiates a decision from a risk from a gamble? And in my opinion, the answer is nothing. Nothing differentiates a decision from a risk from a gamble except how we think about it. All decisions have risk. If they had no risk at all, they wouldn't be a decision. I guess they would be. They'd be the, the, the decision between doing the certain bad thing and the certain good thing. Um, but uh, otherwise, um, a risk and a gamble are only different in that we think of gambling as bad. But actually, with gambling, we know the odds. Like, if you're going to play blackjack, the odds are really well known. Risks are the unknown odds. So the point is. Uh, yes, Liger, the question app does want you to log in and I'm sure you can do it. Please do. I don't use your personal information. I don't get it. It goes to Twitch. It's just your Twitch ID. Nobody is stealing your data. Wow. I am not stealing your data. Somebody else might be, but it's not me. Go. Um, all right. So anyway, yeah, the government. Um, all right, so moving on. Um, last story, and then we'll roll into questions. So there's a mountain in the North Cascades called Liberty Bell. And I went um, climbing there. And uh, for consequences, I didn't think ahead about the consequences I might be facing if the climb went poorly. And so bottom line is the climbing party and I, I was with got stuck and we couldn't go up, but we needed to get down because it was getting dark and cold. And I didn't think about the consequences. So I didn't have a jacket. And I was about to have to spend the night on the mountainside. So I had to damn well get down. Well, the long story short here is I rigged a rappel setup over the side of the mountain and I had to back over a cliff without knowing if my ropes reached the bottom, but it was probably the best way down. And uh, the point is, there's a lot of consequences there. And I stood at the edge of that cliff as I about as I started rappelling, wondering if the ropes were going to reach the bottom, thinking long and hard about what I could do to minimize the consequences. And um, the point with taking smart risks is you have to think through what's going to happen if this goes wrong. So sure, most of the time stuff's going to work out, but what if I um, uh, need to figure it out. Um, what if I, what if the gamble I'm taking or the decision I've made doesn't work out the way I want, how do I prepare for it? So, <clears throat> all right, cool. So we have a lot of questions here. I appreciate everyone. Let's jump into those. Tons of people have voted on them. Mods, pop up the first question and let's jump into it. And then we'll talk about some books that might help if you like books, because I'm all about this. So the first question is, when faced with a huge career decision of whether to continue work for others or branch out to work for yourself, what should you be considering in terms of risk? This is an awesome question. And there's so much going on here. Thank you for asking it. And look, I love entrepreneurship. I got to be honest, I'm a crappy entrepreneur because of the level of risk. I'm a conservative person. The shirt is part of it. The working for Amazon is part of it. Um, 
I love entrepreneurs. It takes a lot of guts to go be an entrepreneur. So let's talk about how to set that up successfully. I've joined three different startups where I was like number five into the startup, but I've never been number one in because starting that raw takes a lot of a lot of guts. So first thing to think about is no, obviously, in that case, it's pretty obvious you're making a big decision. So it should be obvious, according to the recipe we've talked about, that you're about to take a big risk. So we can kind of skip that step. You've got it. The second thing is, though, what are all the inputs you can control? So what are all the things you have an opinion on or that you have a chance to influence and set up for your success? So, for example, some of the people here have heard this story before, which is when I started this channel and I started broadcasting on Twitch, I thought a lot about how am I going to make this show successful? How am I going to bring value to all of you who watch and to all the people who watch later on YouTube and listen on podcasts? And I obviously wanted to be successful. I didn't want to embarrass myself. I work for Twitch. I didn't want to be a bad broadcaster. And I wanted to broadcast for a long time, but I realized there's plenty of better gamers than I am. And so when I was running parts of Twitch, Twitch Commerce, et cetera, and now as I run Twitch Prime, I thought through and I said, I can't, um, I can't broadcast games. Like watching me play games badly might be funny for a few minutes, but it's not a thing I'm going to enjoy or anyone else for very long. There are lots of bad game players on Twitch. You don't need one more from me. So what I did is I tested internally. So one of the first questions when you think about as a startup, um, I wonder why the question isn't showing up. That's weird. The uh, pinned question should be showing up, but it's not. So I don't know what's up with that. Oh, I bet I do. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Nope. I don't know. Anyway, so the question... We'll keep answering the question. When you're starting a new business, what do you think about? Think about if you can test. Think about what you can do as a trial or an experiment or any way whatsoever to make sure that you're, um, you get a chance to see. Oh, I bet I know why that's not working. I'm so tempted to fix things live. Let me see if I can pull it off. Yup. Sorry, the tech in me has to fix what's going on. Can't resist. Oh, didn't work. Yeah, it did. There it is. Boom. Look at that. Tech skills on the roll. All right, cool. Um, fixed it. It's very small print. <laughs> yeah. Plus, David, our awesome Dave, our producer, you were just a tiny bit too late. I did it without you. All right. So look, um, now that the question's up, first thing you should consider is can you test? Second thing is, can you afford to lose? Do you have a backup plan? My backup plan, like if this channel failed and nobody liked it, I can quit. I have a day job at Amazon. I work there. This is what I do for fun to help you guys. And I love doing it and getting the chance to help so many people and to talk about topics like risk. But I have a backup, I have an option. So when you're gonna branch out and work for yourself, what's your backup plan? Third question, how long can you sustain the attempt? For example, I started streaming, I did my first streams in February and March. Now we're having great success. I've connected with Devin Nash, who's awesome and supports me. He sends people over. We stream together. We make great content together. I met uh, Shadow Fox, who's one of our mods here and is in the channel. She's incredible. She's given me a bunch of tips. She helps me know how to market the channel. Um, she helps me know how to set up OBS optimally. I get all this help from people. And I had the time to build the channel and learn and become things build up over time and so um uh everyone 
uh, has to build a business. Businesses don't happen overnight. And so I set a goal, which you guys are killing for me. I love it. Thank you. I said, I will keep doing this if I have 20 people show up for every show. At this point, we have 100 plus show up for every show and it keeps growing. And I, the point is, though, if you're going to take a risk, how, what is your success mark and how long will you keep going until you see what you're getting? Um, and how long can you sustain it? So those are the things I'd think about. And I feel like we killed it. So we're going to move on on that question. But if people have follow-ups on it, I'm going to take a second like I uh, um, agreed. And I'm going to read chat and catch up. And then we'll roll to the next question, which is very long. It's going to be so long, it's not even going to show up on screen. Um, <clears throat> or when it does, it will be very long. All right. Uh, and that's okay. So let's see in chat. First, yeah, um, look, uh, we try and keep a really kind, polite chat. Everyone is welcome, but uh, we are a professional community of people working to get better. So look, we like jokes, but uh, everyone, please have a good time. All right, uh, what else um, is in here? It's mostly about moderation. Okay, cool, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> all right. So another piece of feedback I got is that I shout into the mic. So I said, shadow gives me good advice. She said, I should keep the mic so close. I can lick it, um, which was a little bit disturbing at first, but it's actually been great. And I'm not shouting tonight. All right. Um, I'm just excited when I get loud. That's different. Next question. Most of us share a very heavy work schedule in our late 20s. Yes, and the rest of your life. Um, from your experience as a father, what were your philosoph what were your philosophy and stuff you feel you should have known about raising your children or fatherhood in general? Also, if you can touch upon, how do you handle when your children know you might have a lot of money, especially if you want them to earn it rather than have it? Wow, this question has a lot of pieces. And uh, Roy T. Uh, T. Y. Kim, thank you for the sub. I'm going to jump in answering the question, and I'll be back in chat as soon as I finish. So first, someone asked me about work-life balance in like the last talk I did. And I said, there are choices you can make about your priorities. I was coaching someone. Um, but uh, there are choices you can take about priorities. You're going to probably work pretty hard if you want to get ahead. Life is short. Time is limited. The first thing you can do, though, is get clear on what your priorities are. Is it money or is it family? Yes, you need money to have a family. Yes, sometimes people whose priority is money still want heirs that they can, I don't know, control or whatever. But being really clear on your priorities will let you know where to spend your time. Second, if you've not heard of the Pareto principle, you use that, the 80-20 rule, to try and do the things that will get you the most impact with the least time. What do I feel I wish I had known about raising your children and fatherhood in general? I'm not sure how this has to do with taking a risk, but we'll talk about it for a minute. Parenting is a huge risk. Some of you know my daughter is adopted from China. So when I adopted, we had no idea what, what she would be like. Maybe she would be brilliant. Maybe she wouldn't. Maybe she would have an illness. Maybe she wouldn't. Um, as it turns out, I'm an engineer and uh, I'm very not artistic. My daughter has all these artistic genes. Um, and a super hard thing, that risk was realized like, oh shit, I can't actually parent very well in this because I don't know it myself. So, the thing about when you decide to be a parent is you've got to sign up for unlimited risk. Nobody knows what their kids are going to bring them. You hope 
your kid is going to be smart and well-behaved and happy, and you get all kinds of stuff. Hopefully you get great kids, but talk about taking a risk you should plan through. You got to be committed to weather the outcome because um, somebody once said to me, a minister actually, no one is as, um, no one is, no parent is more happy than their least happy kid. And I completely agree with that. Uh, if one of your kids is sick or unhappy or miserable, as a parent, you're pretty much going to be miserable with them because you signed up to love them for life. So, can I touch upon how you handle when your children know you might have a lot of money, especially if you don't, uh, if you want them to earn it rather than have it? That was the other half of this question. Well, again, I'm not sure it's on topic with risk, but it's a fun question. And one of the pieces of feedback I got from Devin's channel, which I appreciate is be less uptight about being on topic. So I'm gonna call out to the mods and say, it's refill time, because um, I will have this gone before you're up here, or when you come up to get the glass, whatever. And meanwhile, we'll wax philosophical about money and kids. Done. All right, so now a hand is gonna come through this curtain and make the glass disappear, and then they'll make it reappear. And yes, this is the spicy whiskey. This time it's spiced apple, I think. It's like an apple sidecar. All right, so let's say you're successful, which is the point of this channel, and you're gonna have um, a bunch of money at some point in your life, which I want for all of you. It's about all of you having a bunch of money. There's the hand. The curtain didn't visibly move though, but the glass is gone. All right. Um, so uh, God bless you. I want this to happen for every one of you who wants it. So now you're rich or kind of rich or wealthy and you have all these kids, you're worried about being spoiled. The first thing is um, tell them up front, tell them all through their lives, they're gonna have to earn it and show them that. Second thing is one of the reasons I stream is so my kids have a record of what I believe after I'm dead. So yes, these streams are for you. Um, and these streams are for uh, the people on YouTube and to help people. But I also think there'll be a record for my kids long after I'm not here. So hopefully one of my kids is watching this 25 years or since I hope to live longer than that, 50 years from now, or maybe a grandkid with a tear in their eye for poor old grandpa who's long gone and they're getting something out of it. Or at least they're like, well, he was fairly cool for his time. My God, it wasn't 3D, it wasn't a hollow tank, and we didn't live in space, but he did pretty well for being stuck in the earth with a 2D camera. So given that, um, what you do is you tell your kids what you're gonna, what to expect, and then you let them see you working hard. My kids all see me busting my ass at Amazon and here. And so they have some idea that like stuff doesn't come for free and we make them work for things and we tell them it's not going to be given to them. So my philosophy is don't pass on a ton of wealth to your kids. It mostly screws them up. Um, and if you look at America, and I know not all of you live in America, but if you look at America today, look at who most of our entrepreneurs are. They're either first generation or second generation immigrants. Now, not all of them, but Bezos, second generation immigrant. Elon Musk, first generation immigrant. Larry and Sergey from Google, first generation immigrants, etc. cetera. Um, Americans have it really well. We grow up with lots of stuff. We're very pampered. And so it takes away drive because hunger is great energy. I once, um, story time, I once had an employee at my first job long before Amazon. I had my first interview, uh, uh, my, sorry, my first direct report from India. And I was talking to him and I said, why did you come to America? And he said, you know what? Um, because in America, even your poor people are fat. 
And back then in particular, starvation, which still happens in India today, was a very real thing. And so to him, the fact that we were a rich enough country that even the poor people who weren't doing very well could be fat was amazing to him. And what a place to live. Well, we don't think that way. So that's my answer to this question. I'm going to check out chat again. Kristen, I love that you uh, have, have your whiskey out. It's like a connection all the way back to Ohio. Weiger says, hunger is not good for energy. Please eat food. That's true. It's good for motivation. Um, uh, Mech boss, I don't know. Congratulations. I'm glad you got something early. And yeah, it can kill your ambition. People who are striving. There's a quote I like, which says, um, all um, reasonable men or women in this case can form to their environment. Therefore, all progress is due to unreasonable men. So uh, I can hear my moderators downstairs making the next drink, which I appreciate. So I'm going to myself save off this question and move on to the next one, um, which is, do you know if there is a correlation between introverts or extroverts and risk taking? I don't. But we do have a couple doctors here and we have a lot of people in chat who love to opine. So if anybody in chat knows, pop off. I don't personally think risk, my, my guess, this is a guess, not data. I don't think risk is correlated with introversion or extroversion. I actually don't know, but I would think we obviously probably believe that extroverts, because they're out there publicly are and like to talk, are more likely to take risks. But actually, a lot of super silent people are still very bold. And so all I hear ice, ice cubes. There we go. There's the handoff. Thank you. All right. So I do want to say we haven't talked about books. And we often talk about the book um, mindset. I think risk is about having a growth mindset that believes that you can achieve. Although I know a lot of people who believe that they um, they believe that they're going to be successful no matter what. And so they have a high tolerance for risk. But let's quickly roll through a couple books and then I'll keep going on this. So I'm going to pop over, uh, number one, a book you've all heard about a lot from me, Decisive. If we're talking about taking risks, this is the number one book on making decisions. I talk about it all the time. A lot of people have read it. Devin had it as a book club book and thought it was amazing. Devin Nash. Um, this book is all about how to make good decisions and taking smart risks is about taking good decisions. But we don't often think of decisions as having risks. And I wanna point out this book is really about risk. Second book, this one is by Taleb, Nassim Taleb. I have not read it and I wanna be clear, I have not. Um, super well known. Uh, black Swan. For those of you who don't know about a black swan, uh, let's see if it shows up here. The impact of the highly improbable is the subtitle. The thing to understand about black swans and risks um, is with a risk, you have to be really sure that something's not going to happen. Because with black swans, bad things can happen that are very unlikely. It's like a classic black swan was Hurricane Katrina flooding New Orleans. It was very unlikely, particularly in any given year, but catastrophic when it happened. And so the idea of the black swan is actually you can make a good decision that has very low risk, but very high consequences when the risk hits. And so the point I want to make here is be careful when you're considering trying to take a smart risk. Remember to ask yourself, not just how likely is the, is the downside, but how bad is the downside? 
So a lot of the stuff I do when I'm mountaineering, for example, the odds of something going wrong aren't very bad, but the consequence is death. And then there's a lot of things I do every day where the risk is not nearly as much. Like I talk about people go speeding, most drivers speed. Um, if you're speeding, uh, so what? Because in a sense, the downside is you get a ticket. And it just isn't the same as death. Now, if you speed and you kill somebody, different problem. But speeding and tickets just are not the same as hurricanes. So that's the point of Black Swan and understanding the impact of the highly improbable. Last book I'll talk about, and I talk about it all the time. Um, why is it showing audible? That is not what I want. There we go. Ah, here we go. Nope. Where did we lose this? Oh, holy hell. There we go. Rejection proof. So I talk about rejection proof. Oh, it's because I'm on Audible. I listen to a lot of things. By the way, I highly recommend Audible uh, just because you can get in twice as much and you can play books on more than 1x speed and you can listen extra fast and get more into your brain quicker. Um, so I use it all the time. But Rejection Proof is a book. Um, why am I talking about rejection proof in the context of risk? And because the camera's cutting off my chin, I'm going to go back to the main camera and we'll make that window a little bigger in the future. But um, why am I talking about rejection proof in the context of risks? I'm talking about rejection proof because the book really covers how to increase your risk tolerance, your ability to deal with the feeling of being at risk, the feeling of being scared the feeling of, oh crap, I'm about to do something dangerous or uncomfortable. Rejection proof will give you practice for how to sit with your feelings because most of us have to run away from our feelings and medicate them. Um, and so if you can get away from that and if you can stand the tension, you can be a lot stronger. All right, so let's see. I haven't talked about top risks I've taken that worked out uh, in Amazon. Oh, hell, I didn't transition this back. Um, can you explain what a one-way door is and how it relates to risk? So this is an Amazon, uh, and Pashi, I see your comment. I will get back to it when I'm done here. Uh, can you explain what a one-way door is and how it relates to risk? This is an Amazon concept, and I'm eager to share it. So you can read about this, Bezos talks about it. And um, a one-way door is a risk that is not reversible. And that's contrast to the idea of a two-way door, which is something you can undo if it doesn't work out. So example, streaming. I started streaming and I wasn't sure how it would go. After all, nothing I do here normally fits Twitch. And all the folks from Devin's channel throw up the eggplant for me, right? The point is, Twitch is a place where people come to chill and hang out. They come to watch games. And most of the people playing games, I could be their dad. And if I couldn't be their dad, I could be their way the hell older uncle or brother. And so what's the old guy with the white hair going to do on Twitch that's going to be interesting? And am I going to be any good about it? Uh, and then I worried, like, hey, people know I work for Twitch. I work for Amazon. I run Twitch Prime. Is everybody with an issue about who got banned going to show up in my chat and rail about, hey, Ethan, why did so-and-so get banned and blah, blah, blah. And all I'm going to do is my mods are going to be working overtime, chucking people out of the chat. And the people who are in my chat from staff are going to have to be here, like controlling the chat so I can even talk. Well, none of that shit ever happened. And by the way, Mark Twain had a good point. If you've never heard this quote, I'll share it. Mark Twain, I think it was him, said, in my life, I've had a great many troubles, most of which never happened. 
He understood the fact that we are way better at envisioning shit going wrong than it actually going wrong. We are way better at fearing stuff than having it actually happen. So great news. None of that ever happened. No eggplants came into my chat. Our mods, honestly, have lots of time to make me spicy whiskey cocktails because they rarely have to police anyone. We had to police one person today, and that's unusual. Usually, it's nobody. <laughs> Why did that easy coach guy get banned? So, the 3Y gun, uh, I normally no longer try and watch chat, but your your message shows exactly why Easy Coach got banned because he was supposed to be the Easy Coach. After my initials, my middle initial is Z, so I thought, great, EZ. All right, back to one way door and two way door. A two-way door, therefore, is me streaming. I could always quit. If it didn't work, I could bail. So that's something you can do that you can get out of. A one-way door is something once you're committed, um, once you're committed, you're stuck with it. And there's no way out, uh, or it's very, very hard. And so Bezos talks about one-way doors. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we can play a game. Guess Ethan's middle name. It's not a secret, and there are a couple people who know, but nobody ever figures out what a Z name should be. Google not allowed. My brother is Zach. All right. Um, Two-way door is reversible. One-way door is not reversible. What Bezos talks about one-way door is not being something that's not reversible. His classic answer is that um, a one-way door is lowering price because you can never raise it again. So if you take something that's 50 bucks and you start, uh, whatever it is, this bottle of whiskey that's empty now, um, if you start with a $50 price point, and then you teach people, you lower the price to 30 bucks, and you teach people they can get this bottle of whiskey for 30 bucks. If you then try and sell um, the whiskey for 50 again, people rebel and they're like, man, those suspect guys, they jacked the price up. So, Amazon, where this story comes out is a one way door is anything you can't reverse. And the example was when Amazon did free shipping, not prime, but free shipping, when you ordered a certain amount, they knew it would work, but uh, the mods will have to tell you how much that whiskey co costs. I have no idea if it's $50 whiskey, but it probably is. Um, and because it's some micro whiskey and flavored and that jacks up all the price. All right. Um, what they did is they started at $100. And they said, if you order $100 of stuff, we'll ship it free. Well, that worked. So then they said $75, then 50. And then finally they realized we can lower it to 25. But once you have $25 shipping, free shipping, you can't go the other way very easily. It's very hard. Now, if you're observant, um, You'll notice I think it's now $35. So like a decade later, we raised it to $35 because items were more expensive and things had inflated. But it's really hard to raise the price of something that you've taught. So that's the difference between one-way and two-way door. And so as it relates to risk, and this is a good question, I almost feel like it was a plant. But if somebody planted it, I don't know who did it. Um, Taking a risk on something that you can reverse is a much easier risk. So uh, tattoos are a great example here that's practical. Tattoos are reversible, but only with a lot of money and a lot of pain and a lot of time. So uh, people, um, you should think a long time before you get something tattooed on. 
as an example, a funny example, I could never figure out what I wanted to have all my life. But uh, in a past life, so to speak, I was going to get my wedding ring tattooed on. And that would have turned out to be an error uh, and very hard to reverse. Um, so <laughs> be careful what you tattoo on. You might have to keep it. That's an example of one-way door. If it's reversible and you can get out of it, you buy a house, you can sell a house. You might lose some money. You buy a car, you can sell the car. You might lose some money. Um, uh, things that are hard to reverse are things like surgery or um, things that have permanent life consequences. And those one-way doors uh, that alter your life permanently or alter your body, those are really big. And so that's, that's the concept. And so if it's a two-way door, take the risk, gamble. And Bezos uses this concept. He pushes us with a thing called bias for action. Yes, Ojo 4, you nailed it. And Pink Dragons, you guys are exactly right. Having kids is a one-way door. You cannot unhave them. You can neglect them. You can be a shitty mom or dad, but they are yours for life. And the courts try and make sure that you keep them and you take care of them. And so that is a perfect example of a one-way door. So I wouldn't say uh, smoking and getting cancer. Smoking, you can quit. If you get the cancer, you can't quit then. So that's a good example both ways. All right, we're going to move on. This is so much fun now. I love these questions. And I'm not sure, by the way, anyone put my name in, um, but we won't go over it. If somebody guesses, we'll figure it out. Um, let's see. I promised to go backwards and find what Pashi said. I come from lower economic background, looking back at the place I had to grow up and all the factors around me. I should be like a criminal or dead, and I managed to dodge all that. Well, Pashi, congratulations. I know you're in our Discord server. Um, by all means, chat with me sometime and tell me more about it if you want. I respect people. I've seen people uh, come out of tough circumstances, and that's fantastic. Um, you know, I'm the most successful. I had three siblings. My older brother is now dead. He was an alcoholic and he drank himself to death. So even though we all had a good family, different kids go different ways. And I understand environment can make a huge, uh, uh, a huge difference. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Pashi still got stuff to say here in chat. Uh, the guesses are fun. Nobody's guessing seriously anymore. But it is weird. My middle name is not that weird. People just don't think of it. Um, uh, Chalupa, who works at Amazon with me, says there's an important distinction here, though, on this topic. It's not that you shouldn't make one more one way door decisions. You just have to make them very carefully. That's right. Look, I'm all about taking big risks. Um, take all the risk you want, but if it's a big risk with what that isn't easy to get out of, think very carefully. Um, most of the best things that have happened to me at Amazon have been gambles. I gambled on, um, some stuff about how we launched Amazon video. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. People have probably heard my TiVo story. Uh, I bet on putting our service on TiVo and it turned out that got us all the other smart TVs and really grew that service. Um, so I made a bad bet later on at Amazon trying to launch something I hadn't tested enough and I got busted and got in trouble with David, uh, with, um, with Jeff Bezos. I survived that though, by taking a gamble and going to talk to him right after I'd made him mad. And so I sat next to jeff in a meeting when he was very angry at me but i made him uh i don't know if i made him i chose to face him and in person he wasn't nearly as mean to me as he had been in email he wasn't as mad he wasn't able to stay mad in person so that was a gamble a risk i took that worked out hmm. i feel like i'm teaching you guys bad habits by having new cocktails every week but i guess you're all <laughs> 
uh, all right. So, uh, yes, that's right. Phyllis Singh for you has to disqualify herself from guess my middle name. There's a few people who do. Uh, my middle name is Zebra, is Zeus. These are all killer middle names. Zorro, Zurich. I would love to have all those. I love to go to Zurich. I haven't been there since I was a kid. Zorro. I love the scene where, um, what, Antonio Banderas explains that he knows how to use the sword. He says the pointy end goes in the other man. I think that is a great short summary. All right, let's go on with questions. Um, I'll let the mods do their job and pin this next one. What are your top two triggers, no pun intended, or signs that a risk is worth taking for better or worse? Yes, I agree with you, Undead Bandana. That was Catherine Zeta-Jones, one of her better movies. All right, top triggers. Oh boy. Um, so for me, I love to take risks and this is a good story. So a lot of you know, I, I built bits. And if someone just cheers more than 200 bits right now, they can displace David, our honorable, awesome Dave as number one uh, in the channel for bits. But if they don't, that's okay. Cause this is all here for you guys for free. But I had to call him out and put some pressure on him. Um, so uh, one of the signs, like when we were getting ready, ready to launch bits, there were people at Twitch who said, you know, uh, partners aren't going to like this and we should be very careful launching it. And um, we need to roll it out slowly. And what if people don't like it? And there were a lot of concerns. And the thing about Twitch you have to learn is on Twitch, somebody will damn well criticize everything. So Bezos has this saying, and it's not just about Bezos, but Bezos has this saying, um, uh, oh, I see somebody finally got my middle name right. Good job. Um, uh, Bezos has this saying, which is, if you don't want to be criticized, for God's sake, don't do anything new. I don't think he said God's sake, but whatever, something like that. Look, um, for uh, bits, Andy Jassy, who runs Amazon Web Services, said, you guys are going too slow. Just roll it out. So we just rolled it out to everyone. And you know what? A few partners squawked like, I don't like bits on my channel. I don't like these. I use donations instead. The margin isn't the same as if you donate to me with PayPal, blah, blah, blah. But most people immediately used bits or they turned it off and they didn't. The point is, I don't, I normally take risks when somebody's just worried about what someone else might say. And particularly, if you've arranged it so they have an option to opt out. So I will tell this story again. After we built bits, we had the, the um, idea to allow people on Twitch to be affiliates. So we said, look, you know, partnership is great. It's fantastic. We love our Twitch partners. And we saw Sheena was here earlier. We saw Devin here earlier. We had a bunch of partners in the chat. Thank you for being here. But, um, uh, what we did is we said, look, um, for, I lost my train of thought. Unbelievable. Um, risks, uh, somebody remind me. Wow. I blanked. I've had too much to drink. So I'll have some more. Hmm. Thank you, chap. So we had ways for people to opt out. We decided to have the affiliates program and partnership is great. But again, the same thing arose where uh, I won't call any of them out, but some then members of the partnership team said, uh, you know what? If you let affiliates have the sub button and if you let affiliates have bits, um, uh, you're going to ruin partnership and no one will care about being a partner anymore. And all of our partners are going to be super mad and they're going to come after you and we're going to have a riot and you absolutely can't let anybody else earn money. And we talked about it internally, but essentially I said, yeah, I don't believe it. 
Um, and in fact, what happened is we let all the we let everyone be an affiliate, right? Very simple requirements to be an affiliate on Twitch. And people got a few partners did pop off and they're like, hey, I worked really hard to earn money. And they cried about it. And the great thing was other partners came out and said, so what? You just want to hoard it all to yourself? Do you remember how hard you worked? Like, give these people a break and don't be selfish. And basically, the community stood up and silenced the few partners who complain. So answering the question, sign number one or trigger number one is don't be afraid of negative feedback. There is always, always somebody who's going to tell you why your idea is bad. In fact, if you can't find a bunch of people to tell you your idea is bad, you probably don't have any friends. Because it's so much easier to envision problems and bag on something than it is to envision what could go well. And so people will complain to you all the time about what's going to go wrong. You've got to get really good at ignoring that shit and pushing through it. Um, it doesn't mean you don't listen. doesn't mean you don't take into consideration what they're going to say. But just think about anything you've done in your life and how many critics there are. There will always be critics. All right. Do I have a second sign that a risk is worth taking? Yes. Are you going to hate yourself or have regrets if you don't do it? Like, if you're, if the consequences are acceptable or tolerable and you're going to hate yourself if you don't do it, then you should do it because even if you get burned, um, that's really worth it. And so I'm going to give a very personal example, leaving out some details. Um, I mentioned earlier that I have an ex-wife. And uh, when we were having trouble in our marriage, I had a chance to leave and probably good reason to leave. Um, she had done some stuff that wasn't very cool and I had a chance to leave, but I really wanted to keep my marriage together. And I thought about, and I said, look to myself, I talk to myself a lot. It's a good way to get, uh, intelligible answers. Um, I said, look, uh, self, you're probably going to get burnt on this. It probably isn't going to work out. But I want to be able to know I did everything I could to keep this marriage together. So I stayed in it when I shouldn't have. And sure, is, uh, sure enough, more bad things happened. And eventually I had to give up. But I could then face myself even though I'd been burned. I took the risk knowing I might get burned. But the consequence of getting burned was worth it to know I had done everything I could. And so my example of you on taking risk is if you're not going to be able to live with yourself if you pass it up, like I have a friend who's considering starting a business, um, I think she should take a shot at starting the business because if she doesn't start the business, she's always going to wonder what might have happened. Could I have worked for myself? Could I have had financial freedom? Was I capable? And you know what? If the business tanks and it doesn't work out, she can always go get another job. She's had many jobs, but she's never run her own business. So sure, it might go wrong, but it might go right. And that's why you take risk. All right, we have a ton of people. Thank you for all of you who are voting. We have a ton of people who want me to answer this next question. So we're going to go to it. And Kristen, I'm happy to have shared the personal example that situation sucked. Someday, never, I will give out all the details. Never. Unless I get more good whiskey. All right. Um, what is your thought about taking risks in university, applying to do the exams or delaying it? So if you wrote this question, um, explain to me what you mean by applying to do the exams or delaying it while I answer the first part. My thought about taking risks in university is absolutely positively. Um, uh, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. The consequences of risks in university 
are lower than about anywhere else in your life they could be. I'm going to move the camera a little bit. All right. I like it better there. Um, so what are the, uh, what are my thoughts about taking risk in university? Do it, do it, do it, do it. Because sure, you can get a bad grade. Don't get yourself expelled. Do finish your degree, maybe. Hey, Froki, thanks. <laughs> oh, harsh. Bits rivalry. Be careful, Froki. Plus, David can be competitive. Um, what are your thoughts about taking risks in university? Oh, we've got the bits train going. So uh, I love it. What a better time. You're young. You probably have no kids. Yes, you have a little bit of debt, but you're going to have that anyway. You have freedom. You have your whole life to recover from it. If you're an old bastard like me and you screw something up, you're running out of time to fix it. But if you're young, you have all this fabulous time to go after it and take risks and learn from it and learn what you like and learn what you don't. Um, now, let me see if anybody uh, explained. University is the only time in your life where your only job is to learn and to explore. Ojo 4, that is exactly right. Um, uh, let's see. Did anybody explain? Uh, Zelkova 204, I'm glad you quit your job to freelance. If that's what you wanted to do, you can always go back to a job. Um, I didn't talk about this book yet. I talk about it all the time. I'll see if I can bring it up. The best book on earth on this uh, really is, um, shit, let me get it, uh, is, um, and a lot of you know it because Devin recommends it and I love it too, and that book is um, The 4-Hour four four hour Work Week. This book is amazing um, about taking risks and the fact you can always get your job back. Look, the world wants, um, I'm going to bring this up real quick. Do, do, do. This is the book. So if you haven't read this book, think about this, right? It's got a 4.4 star rating with 5,000 reviews. There are very few books on Amazon with 5,000 reviews. There are very few books that average 4.4 stars. Um, this is my actual account. And I want to point this out to you. I purchased this book three times back in 2010 when I discovered it. It came out in 2009. I read it. I bought copies for other people. I read it again. Like, uh, you totally want to read this book if you want to know about the ability to try things in your life and then try again or go back to a regular job. He makes that point way better than I possibly could. And university is like a free chance. Um, is a free chance to do that on the cheap. So absolutely. As long as you're not going to prison uh, or getting expelled, um, go take risks, experiment, try different things because it's all recoverable. It's all one-way doors. Uh, Mullet Boy 3000 says, I've read that book, but I guess it didn't sink in. Read it again. Name of the book again, please. Uh, the book is The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Uh, here we go. We'll stick it up here again so you can see it. It's this book. I've read it many, many times. I actually keep the book in my car on audio and read it over and over. All right. So <laughs> uh, we talked about one-way doors and two-way doors. Yeah, this is a two-way door. If I said one-way door, I meant it's a two-way door picking things to do. Wow. Someone voted the hell out of the next question, and it had to be Awesome Dave with his bits. He's encouraging people to know you can pump a, a, a vote um, in our extension by spending bits. Uh, awesome Dave wrote the extension. So if you use bits to pump up a vote in extensions so that I answer it, um, he gets some of the bits. So that's entrepreneurship and advertising all, com all combined. Mm. All right. Lanufel says he explained what I meant by the second half of the question. In the German system, if you fail the exam three times, you are expelled and can never apply for the same degree in the land. In other words, you lost all the progress. Okay. So that seems like a one-way door. And I would be uh, very hesitant to get uh, to give up my degree by failing the exam three times. 
but I might fail it once. Um, so, uh, and I sure as hell would explore. Um, I would, life is short and doing what you don't like sucks so bad if you have any choice. In America, anyway, 70% of people, when you survey them, they hate their damn jobs. Talk about it in chat. Let's be honest. We have a lot of, we have a higher, um, more educated, uh, more ambitious set of people here. But be honest, how many of you in chat sound off, dislike your current job? Lassiter likes his job. That's one vote for like. I like my job. That's two votes for like. The Dranzager doesn't like it. Ragnar Jackbrock hates it. Ethernight says it's meh. Plus, David uh, isn't answering. He's talking about other stuff. <laughs> Pashi, I know you don't like your job. Um, I love certain parts of my career field. Furrowkey doesn't have a job yet. He's in school. Um, oh, Dranzager means he loves his job, not me. All right, good. I'm glad you love one. Lanufo doesn't have a job yet because he's in school. All right, we're going to go on to the next question. But the point is, most people hate their job. Take some risk and make sure you find what you want. Um, I can't, me, I can't stay on Twitch chat. Oh, Devin, that's harsh, buddy. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be streaming with Devin on Saturday. We talked about this. We're going to stream Saturday late morning. He's never late. So whenever time we go on on Saturday, it's still never late. We haven't announced a time yet, but we'll stream Saturday. And you guys are going to get a chance. You're going to get a chance to come ask us for raises. We're going to bring live people on stream and let you ask us for a raise. And uh, we... Um, uh, uh, and Shino, you got auto modded. Um, that's too bad, but you're welcome. Uh, that's just auto mod. Our triggers are set pretty tight, so don't take it personally. Um, and yeah, Devin and I have a bunch of ideas, but I got to honor plus David here in a minute. Uh, <laughs> um, he uh, he spent a bunch of bits to pump his next question. So everybody's going to wonder what it is. Like, what the hell did he ask that he was willing to spend $7 or $10 on? Um, but yeah, Devin and I are going to kill it Saturday. And then the show that follows that is going to be even better. He and I really, um, we have good ideas. And he's a huge help to me. Uh, if you're here from Devin's channel, feel free to be nice to him. I love that he comes and watches. Um, and so we're going to jump on this question, though. Pink Dragons, thank you for all the bits. I think that's the first time Pink Dragons has ever used cheering. So uh, much appreciate bits here. Um, Roy T. Kim needs to... Uh, um, oh, I missed... I couldn't watch Devin's show today. All right, we're going to answer this question. So pop it up, mods. It's got 50 damn votes, which if I didn't know that... Um, David paid for them, I would think meant half of you in chat had voted, but the rest of you can go vote on the rest of the questions. Oh, Pink Dragons is going to have to cheer one more bit to get ahead of Dave if she wants. So the question is, can you meme briefly about the choice between corporate loyalty and staying at the same place for a long time versus job hopping every, every two or three years for advancement? in terms of risk. Um, yeah. All right. So before I came to Amazon, where I've been for nearly 15 years, uh, uh, before I, um, did that, uh, <clears throat> before Amazon, I was always at startups where I was three years or less. Um, and so, uh, in those uh, jobs, I job hopped. Like every place I was different. My first job was three and a half years. All of you can follow me on LinkedIn or connect to me there. I invite, I accept almost every, uh, I accept almost every um, uh, connection. I love to have you guys on LinkedIn. You can look at my profile on LinkedIn and see about me. And look on LinkedIn, um, you can see my career. Uh, I 
First job is three and a half years. Next job was only six months. Bad. Uh, next job, two and a half years. Next job, two and a half years. Next job, like a year, a little bit more, like 15 months. And then I came to Amazon where I've been 15 years. So I've done both sides of this. And basically, I would say, and also at Amazon, by the way, I've switched jobs internally every three to five years. So even though I've been there 15 years, I'm on my fourth job. Um, and now it's on. Pink Dragons has taken the bits lead. I got to call that out. But I would say as long as you're putting in two to three years somewhere, if you have a better opportunity after that, internal or external, take it. It's your life. And if you have a chance to move up, do it. Now, if you can do that all in the same company or you get inside a great company, fantastic. Stay at that company. If I had not stayed at Amazon, I wouldn't have had all the opportunities I've had because when I joined Amazon, it was a bookstore. Uh, it sold books, CDs, what are those, and VHS. What's that? Um, the retail was actually called BMVD, which sounds like a venereal disease, but stood for books, VHS, uh, music, and DVDs. Books, video, music, DVD. Um, we didn't have Kindle. We didn't have AWS. I joined it because I needed a job, frankly, and they offered me one. And if I hadn't stayed there, now I'm part of like one of the most uh, amazing companies um, on earth. And so I'm very, very lucky. And I've gotten promoted twice. So I started as what's called a senior manager, um, BMVD, Liger Box, um, uh, <laughs> BNVD. Oh God, Liger's going to have to tell us what BNVD is. Um, so now I'm curious, Liger, what's BNVD? Anyway, I stayed there and I learned a lot and I got all these chances but I still change jobs internally. For those of you who don't know my career, um, I, I uh, started an Amazon video, I built Prime Video, then I went to video games and I ran a game studio. Um, then I went and built our app store and then I went to Twitch and now I run Twitch Prime. So I've changed a few times. Change every two to three years, go when you have better opportunity, never stop growing. The one thing I wouldn't do uh, is if you have a really good boss who's taking care of you and developing your career and investing in you, remember, uh, and I agree, by the way, Lassiter, Amazon is an MMO. I've talked about, I talked with Devin, a career and a role-playing game are not that different. You have a set of stats, your intelligence, your charisma, et cetera, and you're trying to build a career and build up your skills so that you can defeat the boss level monster. Um, there's no, they're, they're very similar. You can think uh, about MMO or RPG all the way from, from school, like school is your initial character. That's where you're like building your initial character sheet and going through the, um, uh, like the tutorial. Like university is the tutorial for a career. So the point is, if you have a good boss who's taking care of you and you can grow and you're getting mentorship, value that. Because every time you change jobs or change roles, you are rolling the dice on getting a shitty boss. And that's a bad deal. Because I shared this on the chat before, more than 70% of people leave a job because of their boss. Now, when they leave, they say all kinds of things. Uh, all right. Wow, Automod catches the word chlamydia, but we approved it. So yeah. <laughs> Who thought? <laughs> Big nut venereal disease. That is great. Right in the middle of an answer about corporate loyalty. We get chat talking about big nut venereal disease. I don't even know where to go with that. That is the best thing in chat tonight, BNVD. <laughs> and way better than chlamydia, by the way. So look, 70% of people leave over their boss. They say all kinds of shit. 
I'm leaving for family. I'm leaving for more opportunity, for more money. But you call them up later and what they tell you is, I hated, <laughs> I hated my boss. Um, uh, and uh, this is, just gets better and better. The Liger stuff, doctors are scary people. If you are not afraid of medicine, get older. So I have my first, we talked, somebody, Kristen, who was here, maybe she's gone to sleep now because it's late on the East Coast. I have my first colonoscopy, colonoscopy coming in a few weeks. And I'm actually scheduled to stream the night after it. So for years, I've called colonoscopies the ass telescope, and now it's my turn. So <laughs> I'll be streaming. Well, if I cancel a stream suddenly in December, you'll know. Um, you'll know why. So, yeah, extra whiskey that night. If I do a stream standing up and I'm not in Dave's, uh, if I'm not in Dave's studio where I normally stand, you'll know why. All right. So, finishing up this question. Corporate loyalty is great because you can build up a reputation. So I've built a reputation in Amazon and that allows me to pick jobs with new bosses if I want. And so that's a value of it. But overall, get away from bad managers, get close to good managers, stick with them even if they go somewhere else, and do what is best for you. But don't jump jobs too fast. This question said job hopping every two or three years. Totally do that if you have a better opportunity, internal or external. Uh-oh. They will give you Loraz. Yeah. <laughs> so Liger, how long after I get home can I drink? I will not drink beforehand. And yes, I know there's sedation involved. I don't like sedation, but that is what it is. And in this case, it sounds good. LG Air says, is the 70% manager thing, people saying the manager is the only reason or the primary reason? Um, so, uh, well, yeah, but they're conservative, Liger. They'll end up telling me, like, don't drink for two weeks. You got to tell me the actual truth. Like, am I going to die if it's an hour after or like six hours after? Um, cause you know, you doctors are afraid of being sued and you like put all these bounds on everything that are super conservative. Um, T weirdo says three days, three days. Wow. Then I can't drink on stream. All right. I'll have to hydrate. Kyle is sometimes here always telling us to hydrate. So we'll switch to water. <laughs> um all right moving on i think you should uh corporate loyalty is good if it's working out but otherwise move on we got a lot of votes for other questions this is fantastic i love the big stream by the way there's tons of people here thank you all for watching i'm ethan evans um and we do these streams to educate I'll talk a minute, pop up the next question, mods, and while it comes up, I'll talk a minute about streams we have coming up. I'm going to be streaming with Devin this Saturday. We have a special stream coming, but more than that, because uh, Devin can tell you all about that, we'll do a stream next Saturday, this coming Saturday, where you can ask us for a raise. On Monday, we're going to do a stream. Next Monday, I'm going to have the head of Amazon Recruiting on my stream. And uh, sorry, the head of Amazon student recruiting. So I know a lot of you are students. He's going to talk. We're going to talk about how we test students, how many students we hire. It is thousands of interns and thousands of full time into the great Amazon opportunity. By the way, someone asked me earlier, would I have stayed at Amazon if I had joined as an entry level engineer? I don't know. Entry level engineers do super well here, but the work is really hard. And so you learn a lot. That was Roy T. Kim. Uh, 
I think plenty of engineers have stayed a long time. Some of our most senior people now joined as college students. I have a peer vice president who joined as a summer intern. He was going to be a doctor and he joined as a summer intern to have something to do while he was in pre-med and he never left. So please follow the stream and please come back next Monday because even if you aren't a... Um, if you aren't interested in getting a job as a graduating student, understanding how Amazon recruits thousands of students is worth knowing. You want to know that. All right, we're going to jump to this next question, which is great. What could risk taking look like for an engineer working towards being an expert as an IC? Get on high risk projects. Um, risk taking as an engineer looks like several things. It's a great question. Thank you. Number one, there will be projects in your company that no one wants to touch because they might not work, because they're um, boring technology, someone thinks, because they uh, are hard. Go towards the high risk projects, take risk there because you'll be appreciated. You'll get to be more senior than you are. The problems are hard. And if you conquer the hard problems, you will get a reputation. So taking a risk as an engineer or any other sort of expert is go towards the thing that might fail. The thing that people are saying is hard. Um, Liger, it's a little weird, by the way. I know I said I'd ignore chat. But with you talking about chlamydia and then your mouth being on fire, it's like a bad mix. I know it's about hot food, but really. Um, yeah, I see means individual contributor. So the point is any role, if you don't wanna be a manager, but you wanna move up, go towards the hard problem. Go towards the thing people think is going to fail or that everyone else is like, I'm not touching that. Talk to your boss and say, look, I'm going to take a shot at it. I'll tell a story. Um, one of my mentors in Amazon was a guy. Oh, shit. What was his last name? See, this is bad when you get old. Senior moment. Brian Valentine. So Brian Valentine came to us from Microsoft, and he was responsible for shipping Windows 4.0, I think. So some people may know Brian. They may like him. They may hate him. But um, the point is, he was asked to take over Windows 4.0 when it was failing. When it hadn't shipped, it was months late, it was a mess. And he said, look, um, I." he was asked by Steve Ballmer, the then CEO of Microsoft, to take it on and fix it. And he said, well, look, you're firing the guy who's got it right now. If I take it on and it doesn't go well, am I going to get fired? And Ballmer said, no, you won't get fired. He said, great, I'm in. I will try anything. I will take any risk. I will take on any crappy project as long as I won't get fired. And so he dove in and shipped Windows, and now he's a zillionaire. He made a zillion dollars the first time at Amazon, or sorry, at Microsoft. Then he came over to Amazon, and because he had made a zillion dollars at Amazon or Microsoft, we had to pay him a zillion to come to Amazon. So now he has two zillion. And he married a beautiful woman in the in the trade. Um, so, uh, who, by the way, was a VP at Amazon and didn't need his money. So it wasn't about the zillion dollars. So the point is, yeah, he's got two zillion now. Um, zillion should be my new middle name, I fault. I'll change it from your guess. Anyway, point is, go towards the big risks. So it fails, so it blows up engineers will always be valued and can always get jobs even if their project failed because you can say this big project tanked and i learned so much um so uh go ahead and take risk and that's how you move forward as any sort of professional liger can talk about this he's in a high risk area now and he's working for a great new boss who he thinks will win the nobel prize so we have people in chat who've taken these risks as individual contributors. You go towards the thing that's gonna pay off. You go towards the thing that will build your skills and is hard 
Because if you do want to get better, go towards the hard work. You're not afraid of hard work, are you, right? You're smart. And I love all the people following. Thank you for all the followers. All right, moving on. We'll do a couple more questions. We have a lot of votes here, so I feel loyal to you. But at the same time, I'm sure my dinner is already quite cold. As a manager, how do you encourage your team to take smart risks? Well, let's talk about how you discourage them. You discourage them by punishing them when they fail. So look, um, as a manager, the way you encourage them is when things go wrong, you don't go on a hunt for the guilty. And if other people are complaining to your team or want to come after your team and say, you screwed this up, you have to stand in front of them and say, no one on the team is responsible for this except me. I'm the leader. I'm the manager. I made this choice. The problem is mine. If you lead that way, your team will see, oh, it's safe to take risks. As a manager, you encourage your team to take smart risks by making them safe, by keeping them safe to take those risks. And you create safety by protecting them from blowback politically and not dinging them yourself. Now, it's fine to do a post-mortem as long as you actually study what went wrong and you use it to learn. If you use it as a hunt for the guilty, your team will learn and they will never come back, okay? They will learn that he says he, want risks, he wants us to take risks or she says she wants us to take risks. The post-mortem is the way to encourage risk because it does two things for you. Postmortem means you get together in a meeting and you talk about what went right and what went wrong and you all try and learn from it together. And if it's about learning without blaming, number one, that will make your team smarter about future risks. And number two, they will see that you don't punish people. Um, and we have a river of followers coming in right now, which I really appreciate. Thank you very much for all the follows. Um, so it's about how you lead when things go wrong. It's also about how you re lead when things go right. When something goes right for your team, you celebrate it. And if you celebrate with your team and truly praise people and truly make it a positive, they'll take more risks because they feel safe and appreciated. All right, I think that's actually a great short answer. Hi, I'm Ethan Evans. I hope you've gotten a lot out of this show. To follow us on YouTube, please click the bell icon in the bottom left and subscribe. Also, you can find us live on Twitch, where we answer questions interactively. Further, we have a Discord community, where not only I, but other members of the community team up to answer your questions interactively. Hope you've enjoyed. Thank you.